So over the past couple of days, I have been reflecting on the scripture from Exodus chapter 33, verse 10, where it says, And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. And there are a couple of things that stood out for me. Um, as I was reflecting on this scripture. The first one was this pillar of cloud that appeared. Um, And so this cloud was the physical manifestation of God's presence, right? And everyone could see it. We see that Moses has, he's put up this tent of meeting where he goes and he's intentional about spending quality time with God. And as he does that, God's presence lets everyone know that he has met him there. He has met Moses in his intentional time. So the first thing for me was be intentional about the time that you spend with God. Create a special place, create a special rhythm that you give to God and he'll meet you in that place. And then the second thing that stood out for me is it said that all the people worshiped. But it was interesting that they worshiped at the door to their own tents. If you think about our lives today, right? We're we're in our homes, we have all of these things that could be distracting us. We may have children, we may have deadlines that we need to meet. And so for, for some of us, sometimes when we worship, we are like these people. We're worshiping at the entrance to our tents. We're not very intentional on our time. We give God time because we're in relationship and we need to give him that time, but are we being intentional with it? Are we setting aside a separate place, a separate time? And the, the place doesn't have to be special, guys. You can be at your kitchen table, but you must set that intentional time. And so that was the other thing that stood out for me. It's like, yes, the people are worshiping, but they've got this example of Moses who has been intentional, who has created this space where God has been meeting him on a regular every time that he goes there, but they're not following his lead. They're not following this example of wanting to be in relationship with God and seeking the relationship with God and creating space for him to meet you in your desire for him. Right. So for us today, obviously, we there's not a pillar of cloud that is going to come down. But there are ways that we can be intentional. There are things that we can do despite the busyness of our lives, despite any distractions or any challenges that we may have. We can be intentional with the time that we spend with God. And some of the ways that I've been challenged with in doing that is sitting down and studying the word, studying the Bible, even if it's just one scripture, right? I think a lot of times we think, oh, I must read a whole chapter of the Bible today. But if you read one scripture and you reflect on it and you you talk to God as you're reflecting it, that's letting him know that you want to be in relationship with him. You could also pray. Spend time in prayer, spend intentional time in prayer. If you're a journaler, grab your journal and write your thoughts down. Put on some worship music and worship God. There are so many ways um, that we can be intentional and let God know that we do want to have a relationship with him and he will meet us in those places. I was reflecting in Exodus 33 verse 11 uh, in this portion of scripture, we see how God was communicate with Moses. There is an, an intimacy, there, was, there is a relationship that was very deeper, and God was speaking to Moses mouth to mouth. He didn't want even any, uh, any intermediary, he didn't want to speak to him through the vision, but God was appeal to move to Moses and he was speak to, the, to him clear, clearly. And we can see that there was a, family, a familiarity between him and God. And, and, and in the other side, we can see uh, Joshua. He's a son of Nun. He's a, he's a servant of Moses. The Bible says, the scripture says, when 
Moses went, when Moses built the camp for, for God, Joshua didn't left the camp. He was staying in the in the he was staying in the tent, and we can see a, we can see a, a a picture of a person that's who wanting God, a person that's who seeking God and desiring God. Even though uh, Moses, when he was finished to speak to God, he was leave leave leave, but him he stay in the camp in the tent, and he was seeking and searching God. Desiring God is a choice that we can make. Desiring God, God is, God is seeking for a person that is already open to receive him. God reveal and appeal to a, a heart that is seeking for him. So in Luke 10, we see Jesus visiting the house of Mary and Martha. And as Jesus is there, uh, Mary goes to sit at the feet of Jesus. And as the scripture says, she, she goes to sit and listen to him. While Martha is kind of anxiously moving around, uh, it says that she's making preparations and she's serving. And Martha sees that Mary is just sitting there uh, and she's not helping. And Martha is upset by this. And so she goes to Jesus and she tells him about this. And Jesus responds with the scripture here in Luke 10, 42, where it says, But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Um, the key being, but one thing is necessary. And so when we look at this scripture from Jesus' perspective, I think it's clear that Jesus at this point, is, he's not interested in what Mary and Martha uh, can be doing for him in this, in this moment. He's not interested in, in their preparations or their serving. He simply wants them to come and sit by his feet, uh, to listen to him and be in communion with him. Uh, but when we look at Martha's side of things, we see that her engagement with Jesus or her relationship with Jesus is made up of, made out, out of, out of wanting to serve Jesus, um, wanting to do things for him, making preparations for him. She thinks that this is what requires, this is, this is what is required for her to be in relationship with Jesus, uh, which reminds me of my, my own story and my own relationship with Jesus. There's been a time where I've been so caught up in doing things for Jesus, so in this mindset of my relationship with Jesus is dependent on me doing things for him that I started to develop uh, this mindset deep inside of me and this expectation well if I'm doing all these things for Jesus then Jesus has to do things for me in order for him to be in relationship with me um, and as you can imagine this led to a lot of disappointment uh, a lot of pain and a lot of frustration uh, as we even see here in the scripture as as Martha is is wrestling with this frustration. What happened is I had lost that one thing uh, that Jesus is talking about here, that desire to simply know Jesus and to get to know him um, and that that should be enough. So we're reminded through the scripture that we are enough for Jesus just as we are. Uh, we come before him and he simply desires us and to be in communion with us. He doesn't necessarily desire the things that we can do for him. Um, and so I think the heart is for us to be able to, to do the same, that when we enter into the presence of Jesus, that our one desire above everything else, um, above the things that Jesus can do for us, our one desire, our one thing is to simply know Jesus, to desire him, uh, to want to be in community with him. Um, above everything else. So I have been meditating on Luke 11 uh, verses 1 which reads as follows. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And as I have been reading this verse, the first thing that um, stood out to me is how it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And so 
as we speak about desiring God, this is so important to me because it shows Jesus demonstrating what it means to desire God, right? Because in this time, Jesus was moving around with his disciples. He wasn't by himself. He was with a group of people going around preaching the, the gospel. And as he was doing this, as he was living out his daily life, he took time set time apart, went away and spent time in prayer, right? So when the disciples see him, he's not amongst them. He's on his own, setting time apart, praying, living out what it means to desire God. And it is this example, it's this demonstration that sparks something within one of his disciples. And as, as he sees Jesus communing with God, as he sees Jesus uh, living out what a relationship with God looks like. He says to Jesus, teach us, teach us how to, how to pray. And this is so intriguing for me because I'm like, did they not know how to pray? Did he not know how to pray? An entire disciple of Jesus did not know how to pray. And that's obviously not the case because they were Jews. They knew how to, how to pray. But what this disciple is saying in this moment is that I know how to pray. I know how to recite prayers. But teach me what you do. Teach me this relationship. I want to move from reciting to relationship. I want to move from religion to relationship, to communication, to, to being in, in proximity, to wanting and desiring and, and communicating. And one of the key things from the series has been communicating this two-way thing, right? Not a one-way, I just recite and then I go away, but I'm in relationship, I'm communing. And so this is a cry of this, this disciple's heart, that Jesus, I see you do something different. I see you walk out relationship with God different. Teach us, teach us this thing that you do with God that we don't do. And so at the end, he, he says, just as John, taught his disciples, right? And so we don't have in scripture what exactly it is that John taught his disciples when it comes to prayer. But what we do know, right, is that John was pointing to Jesus. John spoke about, um, about the gospel, about the one who was to come, about the, the, the Messiah. So everything John was teaching, was doing, was pointing to Jesus. It was pointing to relationship with Jesus. It was pointing to the Messiah. It was moving away from, from religion to now relationship. And so it all comes down to, to desire. And we have these three things that are working together, right? We have Jesus setting time apart, going away, praying, demonstrating to his disciples what desiring God, what wanting God, hungering for God looks like. We have the disciples looking at this and going, I want that. I want more than religion. I want a relationship. I want to know how to pray, how to touch heaven, and how to hear from heaven. And then we have John taking it back to the cross, taking it back to Jesus. And for me, that's what stood out in, in our series. Yes, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. Reflecting on, onto that verse, uh, it's very, very interesting to see that it says that one night early, whose eyes were becoming very weak, so weak, to the extent that he could barely see. He was lying down into the temple at his own place. And this verse, if you meditate with me into that, the thought that really rises up and shows me that Eli, who was a mantle to Samuel, he was there, and he was in the temple lying down. He was experiencing a loss of sight, which for Samuel, this could have been cost him a lot because that was his monster, somebody that could lead him, somebody that was there to uh, show him the way. But that person experienced the nature, experienced the deterioration from the nature, a natural experience that made him to lose his sight. This was a practical thing which the Bible is talking about that Eli, Ila, was really lying down. And lying down there, he lost his sight naturally. And this was something that thinking and meditating on someone, this could have become a challenge 
Because this was a mentor, this was a leader, this was somebody that's supposed to help him and facilitate him. And as I got deeper into reflecting into that, I, I realized that uh, as we go into this theory wanting God, Samuel continued to desire God, even though that affect his master, even though his master couldn't see, even though his master had a problem that affected him to the extent that the leading, the leadership, everything that has to do with him, he was like a son to, to uh, Samuel was like a son to, to, uh, to Ila. So Ila was like his father. And this was a model. This was somebody that he could rely on, but he lost sight. And this was a challenge. And in our real life, we all have some realities in our spaces, in places where we find our comfort, in the places where we, we find our support, in places where we, we find different things that make us to function or help us to function and move forward. But the reality of life is this, that there will always be something that can happen naturally. But the stronghold that we can desire, like Samuel, he continued to desire God in the middle of that, he didn't get discouraged because of the state of this person who was there to help him. But this person being blind, experiencing the blindness, these challenges to Samuel didn't stop him to desire, to want God. Same with me and you. We all experience different realities. I don't know what you are going, on to, we are going through uh, in your life. Uh, you might have your reality which are different than mine, but do not let your challenges the realities of your situation stop you, stop me from wanting God, desiring God, because there's no greater need than God. And if we understand that there's no greater need than God, then whether things work perfectly or not perfectly, these things cannot separate us from the desire to continue moving, seeking God's face, desiring him, wanting him, desiring him more and more, because he is the object of our faith. And this is the reality. So what we see in the scripture with Ila, this is a reality that living into this physical world, we can, in reality, continue to experience. Uh, we can be vulnerable like anybody. And this is the reality that we cannot escape. But hold on to your faith and continue to desire God because that is the true object of our faith.